I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for organizing this series and also those who have taken the time to listen in over the last few weeks. Uh, the fact that you've chosen to uh, to join these sessions when there's so much more that you could do with your time speaks volume about your desire and commitment to build a connection with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I pray that Allah gives you an eye deep knowledge of his book and the tawfiq to incorporate its teachings into our lives uh, inshallah. Now I'd like to, I've been asked to uh, present a, the tafsir for in the next 20 minutes or so for the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Ankabut. And given that there is much to cover, I would like to narrow it down and focus on the specific aspect of the uh, of this of the Surah, which is essentially the trials and tribulations as we experience in our day-to-day -day lives. Now Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, as we know, has names of beauty, you know, Jamal, as well as names of majesty, Al Jalal. So names of beauty, for example, the compassionate, um, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the merciful, Al-Latif, the subtle, uh, and, and so forth. And the names of Jalal, for example, Al-Mani'ah, the withholder, uh, Al-Muntaqim, the avenger, uh, Al-Mudhil, the debaser, and so forth. And we see that the world that we live in, it comes about uh, largely through the interaction and the manifestation of these divine attributes and that is why we see that we have uh, ease and happiness and we also experience joy and sorrow. Now with that introduction when we look into the uh, verse uh, the, the first 10 verses and when we look into the uh, the context in which the surah was revealed there are some differences in whether the surah is a, a Mecca surah or a it was revealed in Medina uh, there are also differences in terms of some scholars would identify the first 10 verses to be revealed in Medina and not in Mecca but in general for the most part uh, a lot of scholars would suggest that this surah was revealed right about the time when the persecution in Mecca got to the point where um, just before the the immigration to to Habesha. So the conditions that were prevalent in Mecca at that time, we're talking about roughly the fifth year of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's prophecy in his life in Mecca. So the conditions were extremely trying. Uh, whoever had accepted Islam, they were made a target of tyranny uh, and humiliation. Uh, if that person happened to be a slave or a poor person, they were beaten and subjected to unbeatable tortures. If that person was a, an artisan, for example, or a shopkeeper, there were economic boycotts that those individuals subjected to. If they, they were happened to be from a, an influential family, then they, they were harassed in different ways as well. And so this created an atmosphere of fear uh, in Mecca as a result of which a lot of people who, in spite of the fact that they believed in the Prophet Wasallam's message, they were never able to, to, to declare their faith and they were ne never able to commit to it. Now, the, in these circumstances, although the, the companions who had initially accepted Islam were extremely strong-willed, there were also times when these companions themselves felt very overwhelmed. And uh, one of the examples that is often uh, reported um, in the context of the revelation of this particular surah is that of Khabab ibn Arat, who was radiallahu anh, who was a companion uh, who was subjected to extreme torture to the point that he was forced to lay down on burning coal uh, with, with rocks placed on his, on his chest. Now, after one such experience, he came to the Prophet وسلم, and he found the Prophet um, leaning against one of the walls of Kaaba. And he said to the Prophet وسلم, that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, do you not pray for us? And the Prophet وسلم, was taken up with with uh, emotion to the extent that 
uh, his face turned red. And he said that, that the believers who have come before you, they've been, they've been subjected to even greater persecution. So the, some, some of them, for example, would be placed in, in ditches and they would literally be sawed from head to foot or iron combs would be placed against their flesh and their flesh would be pulled out of their body and so forth. And then the prophet said that by Allah, this message will be fulfilled and the time is not far when a person will travel without any apprehension from Sana'a to Hadramaut, uh, both places in Yemen, and there will be none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whom this person will fear. Now, it is this time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially revealed these verses. So, so we will shall just take a look at that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim alif lam mim ahasib al-nas wa yutraku an yaqulu amanna wa hum la yuftanun that do the people think that they will be left to say we believe and they will not be tried? That we have certainly tried those before them and Allah will surely make evident those who are truthful and he will surely make evident the liars. Now the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses is hasib um, al-nas which is a general reference but as our scholars point out, it specifically targets those Muslims who started to experience and feel doubt that they've been persecuted for so long and they've, they've uh, accepted what they believe to be true and yet they continue to be persecuted. So, so what exactly is going on? Is there uh, any hope for, for things to change? And, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admonishes them, telling them that, um, that this is something that when you make a claim specifically to faith, that claim will have to be validated. And this is not something new that you're experiencing, but this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even pre, uh, nations that came before them, they too were tested in the same, same manner. Now, the word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses, fitna, you know, it's, it's generally used in our common language as in a negative sense, that if you have someone who is uh, a person who's stirring up some kind of controversy in the community, for example, in the masjid, you, know, you may say that, and I'm not condoning it, but you may, someone may say that this person is causing a fitna, uh, or this person is a fitna, or you, you would hear things like the mall, there's a lot of fitna in the mall, for example. But what, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses and, and the way it's been translated generally, um, is a difficult test. When Allah says, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ fitna," That there is a difficult test in your wealth and in your children. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to. But there's another meaning of the word fitna, and, and I would like to just, just mention that. And that essentially refers to the process of purification of gold. That uh, in contrast to something that can be purified simply um, by, by cleansing it at, at, on its surface. If we have clothes, for example, that we wash, any kind of dirt on our clothes can be washed because that dirt essentially is on the surface. With gold, the impurities, they tend to lie deep within the ore. And so gold has to be subjected to extremely high temperatures, bringing it to molten form. And once gold, uh, it comes into molten form, the impurities they tend to rise and at that point, um, you know, the froth at the top is removed and, 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 and the gold is purified. Now, it's no coincidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word fitna and, and, and ties it directly with iman. Because iman is something that we believe is deeply ingrained within us. So it's not something that lies on the surface. And so just as in the process of the purification of gold, that uh, it requires gold to be subjected to extreme temperatures, that in our iman as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, uh, and, and alludes to this, uh, that we will be tested and tried. And, and through that process, we will be purified as well. Now, these fitan, which is essentially the plural of fitna, the, it can manifest in different forms. And, and over time, these forms have changed. Now, one of the misconceptions that we generally have living in the 21st century is that the nature of the fitna have changed and we are the ones who have been subjected to intellectual challenges in a manner that's completely unprecedented. But when we read the sunnah, uh, the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we find some examples there as well. 
uh, that, that would present a different picture. And one of the examples of that is the story of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, when the Prophet وسلم, traveled from Mecca to Jerusalem and then ascended to the heavens, where we all know the story that um, the the Prophet led, he met his patriarch Ibrahim السلام, he led uh, all the, the messengers in prayer, uh, he had the conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where prayers were obligated and then he had the whole exchange with Musa السلام, and when he came back and the next day when he went to the Kaaba to report this, the Quraysh felt that they finally had some ammo against the Prophet um, so they can now um, essentially make claims that the Prophet وسلم, is either a possessed person or he's a mad person who's making claims that he traveled within the span of a single night, he traveled to Jerusalem and came back. Now, this was a difficult time and according to some traditions, some Muslims, they, a few Muslims, even though this is the time when you can imagine only people who, had, who were very strong-willed, they continued to stay and who, uh, they were the ones who had converted to Islam, but some of them, they turned back. And so the Qurayshites, as it's related, they went to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And they asked Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that, have you heard what your friend said? And, and when they, they reported the whole story about the Prophet's travel to Jerusalem and the back, if, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said that, if he indeed said that, then I believe it. And why is that difficult for me to believe when I already believe that revelation comes down to him from the heavens? And that is why we know that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was given the title of the Siddiq. So these kind of challenges that they've, they've been around for, for quite some time as well. And, and over the last 1400 years, maybe it's a little more prevalent in our time where even every, uh, even ordinary people are subjected to these intellectual pressures. But over the last 1400 years of tradition, when you read through the accounts of different scholars, uh, you get a sense of how they've been subjected to these kind of intellectual challenges and how they, they dealt with them um, uh, in, in their accounts. Now in the next verse, the fourth verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَمْ حَسِبَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ أَنْ يَسْبِقُونَ سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ That do those who do evil deeds think they can outrun us? Evil is what they judge. Now in the last two verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially chastised the believers uh, who thought that their declaration of faith will essentially spare them uh, from the persecution. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it a point to criticize all those disbelievers who, who had this mistaken sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is either so weak that he's not able to, to prevent them uh, from oppression, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely unconcerned about their, uh, their oppression and, and injustice. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that evil is what they judge. And then Allah says, مَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ أَجَلَ اللَّهِ لَآتِ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ That whoever should hope for the meeting with Allah, indeed, the term decreed by Allah is coming. And He is the hearing, the knowing. And so it's essentially, it's a reminder to the believer that the trial, however difficult it may appear to be, is still bound to the life of this world. And in comparison, which is by its very nature is, is, is temporal. And in comparison to the eternal life that awaits us, and in comparison to the, the rewards that awaits, await us in the hereafter, uh, this, this, uh, you know, this test is, is really insignificant. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially alludes to in this verse. And then Allah says, وَمَنْ جَاهَدَ فَإِنَّمَا يُجَاهِدُ لِنَفْسِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌّ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ That whosoever strives only strives for the benefit of himself. And Allah is free from the from need of the worlds. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of times when we talk about suffering and pain, um, you know, we traditionally see happiness in opposition to to pain and suffering. But suffering itself, as even a lot of people who are completely oblivious to the life of the hereafter, who are looking at it from a completely materialistic worldview that life of this world is all that is to, to live and enjoy, even from their standpoint, uh, as a lot of contemporary philosophers would talk about, suffering can be a key to unlocking the elusive secret of happiness. So let, let me explain. So if you, 
if you would like to get to the summit of a, of a high mountain, uh, get to the top of a high mountain, and if you take a helicopter ride to the top, the amount of happiness that you feel you would feel in that case, in comparison to the amount of happiness that you would feel when you actually spend 10 to 12 days hiking through difficult terrain and climbing those steep inclines and getting to the top. You know, in the latter case, you would feel your happiness would be exponentially more than in comparison to taking that easier route, you know, that, that helicopter ride to the top. So essentially that pain that I experienced in, in, clients, in spending 10 to 12 days eventually getting to the top, that pain and suffering is what enable that happiness. So pain becomes an enabling condition for happiness. Uh, and, and that's important to keep in mind. Now, Allah used use the word jahada. And what's interesting is that this is the time when any kind of retaliation on the part of the, of, of the believers was prohibited. So they could only patiently endure. And, and so jihad in this case is really holding oneself back, not only persevering with patience, but jihad is also holding oneself back when one feels tempted to retaliate in, in, uh, in response to any kind of physical abuse. And, and, and that's an interesting definition, which is very different from, from Qatar as, as many other verses uh, uh, refer to. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَنُكَفِّرَنَّ عَنْهُمْ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَحْسَنَ الَّذِي كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ that and those who believe and do righteous deeds, we will surely remove from them, we will surely remove from them their misdeeds and will surely reward them according to the best that they used to do. Now, if we understand this verse as in continuation to the previous verse, then that essentially means that those people who believe and do righteous deeds, in spite of being subjected to the the, the tormented conditions and the persecutions, and so that trial and that tribulation essentially functions as a way of their the expiation of their sins. So, And they will be rewarded better and more than, uh, the, than the extent that they, that they deserve. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, And we have enjoined upon man goodness to parents. But if they endeavor to make you associate with me, that to make you associate with me that of which you have no knowledge, do not obey them. Now, the the context of the, the revelation of this verse is essentially um, related to the story of Sa'd ibn Waqas, who was from a well-off family, and he con he accepted Islam in his late teens. Now, when he embraced Islam and his mother came to know about that, she said, I will neither eat nor drink nor sit in shade unless you disown Muhammad, unless you disown Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then she said that the rights of the mother are superior, even according to Allah's command. Therefore, if you disobey me, you will be disobeying Allah, Allah too. And so Sa'ad ibn al-Qas he was perplexed. And he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he related his story and this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse. Now, in the second part of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, bima kuntum That to me is your return, and I will inform you about what you used to do. That essentially the relationships that we have in this world, you know, that between a child and the parent, uh, and the oblig obligations that come about as a result of those relationships, they're confined to this world. But eventually we have to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the parents as well as the children, we, once we return through the creator, if the parents have misled the children, you know, they will be uh, called into account. But if the children have accepted deviation you know, for the sake of parents, they will then be punished as well. And then Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَنُدْخِلَنَّهُمْ فِي الصَّالِحِينَ and, and so the previous ver verse had a uh, rather strong ring of warning in it. Uh, this one essentially is meant for reassurance by giving glad tidings. And uh, the expression, as we talked about, an amin wa amil salihat refers to people who, in spite of all the hostility that they experience from their tormentors, they continue to maintain their faith and, and, and uh, continue to remain diligent about um, 
performing pi uh, pious and righteous deeds. Now, in the last verse, uh, the, in the tenth verse, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ فَإِذَا وَمِنَ وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ." And of the people are some who say we believe in Allah. فَإِذَا فَإِذَا أُوذِيَ فِي اللَّهِ جَعَلَ فِتْنَةَ النَّاسِ كَعَذَابِ اللَّهِ but when one of them is harmed for the cause of Allah, they consider the trial of the Prophet as if it were the punishment of Allah. That if victory comes from your Lord, they say, indeed, we were with you. Is not Allah most knowing of what is within the breast of all creatures? Now, what's interesting is that, so this verse is essentially about the hypocrites. And this is why some of the, uh, some of the commentators of the uh, Mufassirun, they essentially said that this surah is, was revealed in Makkah, or at least portion of it uh, in Medina, or a portion of it were revealed in Medina. Because the whole idea or conception of the Munafiqeen, we didn't have that in Mecca because the Muslims were being persecuted. And only when Muslims uh, came into power, that this whole notion of hypocrisy started making sense to some people, and so they would pretend to be Muslims uh, while, while never really accepting faith in, in, in reality. And so what's interesting, as it's pointed out by Imam Razi, is that even though the speaker in this case is a single person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uses the plural form, the plural pronoun, inna kunna ma'akum, that we have believed. And the subtle point that's associated with this is that Hypocrites always try to be counted among the believers. And that is why they would mention their faith as if they're a part of the, the group of believers. And, and so, and, and, and which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the plural form in this case. Now, there is another, um, about, about this verse, there is a statement that's attributed to Ibn Abbas, عن, in which Ibn Abbas uh, said that, um, that this this was essentially revealed about some of the some of the Muslims who had not openly declared their faith, and and they were forced to accompany the disbelievers when they came from the Battle of Badr, and so that's a statement that's attributed. And so uh, one one of the other statements that one of the other verses that was revealed for them is is from Surah Al Nisa, in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "In the ladina tawafahum al malaika tu zalimi and fushim kalu fi ma kuntum." Indeed, those whom the angels take in death while wronging themselves, the angels will say, in what conditions were you? Um, they will say, we were oppressed in the land. The angels will say, was not the earth of Allah spacious enough for you to emigrate therein? Uh, and, and they would respond, uh, they, they would respond, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَأْوَاهُمْ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا That these are people who continued to live and continue to accept a life of humiliation instead of immigrating. So these were the, the, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who either immigrated much later and who had not uh, openly declared their faith. Uh, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admonishes them and, and describes this in this verse. Um, I think I'm pretty much out of time, so we'll just conclude with that. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, you know, please feel free to post in the chat window. Jazakallah khair for the answer. So inshallah, we'll move to the Q&A session. So as we've done in previous weeks, um, questions should be submitted in writing. Uh, use the question section uh, of the webinar, uh, inshallah, to submit your questions. Um, so, inshallah, first question. Um, when we think of trials and tribulations, many of us think of, you know, pain and suffering and, and the difficulties associated with them and, and the tests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in, in front of us as a result of that pain and suffering. However, for most of us who live in the U.S., we can think of our lives as being full of abundance, full of blessings of Allah, full of ease. Can you comment on how we should approach 
the concept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us during times of ease and abundance and blessing? Okay, that's that's a wonderful question. Um, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the um, hadith of the Prophet in which he said that عَجَبَ li amril mu'min khayr that uh, amazing or how wondrous is the matter of the believer for all that happens to him is good. In the Sabatu Sarra, a shakar of Fakana Khairullah, that if he if good befalls him, he shows gratitude and that is good for him when a Sabatu Sarra, a Sabra of Fakana Khairullah, that if uh, ill befalls him, he shows patience and, and that is good for him. Now, in terms of the kind of affluence, um, I think it's a misunderstanding if we are experiencing um, a life of affluence. That in itself could be a test because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests some people uh, by removing things that they want and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests others by granting them what they've longed for. Um, in terms of the material benefit that we look at, obviously it comes with the responsibilities. If you have places in the world where people are experiencing difficulties, um, making their ends meet, um, living a basic life. You have people who do not have access to basic necessities such as clean drinking water, for example. And if we are aware of that, it becomes important for us to, to share the blessings and, 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 and through that process of sharing the blessings with the others who are not as fortunate, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially is testing us in this manner whether we're able to fulfill and live up to that responsibility or not. Um, yeah, I would just say that. Okay, the, the next question, similar to the mother and child conflict that was discussed, how about husband and wife? Now, if the husband is not following the deen correctly or ignorant of it, what can the wife do? Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in one of the verses, وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضَكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ fitna." that we've made some of you a source of fitna for the others. And, and keeping that in mind, a lot of times we would not experience you know, the kind of fitna that we talked about, uh, people subjected to oppression from tyrannical rulers, for example. Uh, those obviously occur, but a lot of times the fitna that we experience in, in light of the verse, this verse is the fitna that we experience through our relationships. So you may, we may experience joy and happiness in, through our relationships with friends and family members and our children, but they, those same people may then end up becoming a source in trial and tribulations uh, for us. One of the things that is interesting is that we all go through a process of change in our lives. So if the parents were not religious enough uh, earlier on in their lives and they raised their children accordingly, and at a later time, um, either the mother or the father uh, becomes a little more religious based on their experiences or the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them. It's not very simple. It's not, it's not a simple process. And it's not really fair to expect that transition to happen on the part of the children or the, the spouse immediately in the same manner. So there will always have any kind of transition requires um, a degree of patience and, and deliberation. And, and so in a relationship, when a wife is has become more religious or is has been religious and the husband is not able to follow suit or not able to um, have the same kind of longing, if you will, that it has to be a gradual process of dialogue. Uh, you can We cannot really expect any kind of abrupt changes to... Um, uh, to be introduced in the lives of the of your spouse in the same manner as as we've experienced it, and and that it's a, once we keep that in mind and we continue to make du'a to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala can open up doors for us. How would you know um, a fitna and a difficulty in life is a trial rather than a punishment? It's. Um, so it's, it's interesting because this particular verse talks about this and it, it talks about it in, in a not very encouraging manner. Um, whether a fitna that we are experiencing 
is um, a trial or it's a punishment, for the most part, if we have a heart that deliberates on our condition, that continuously looks inside uh, in our inner condition with our, uh, in connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it really is immaterial. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. It's, it's related that Imam Malik, uh, who was, is the, the, the main principal Imam of the Maliki Madhab, uh, and he was based out of Medina, once he came into Masjid Nabawi between the time of Asr and, and Maghrib prayers. And, and in the Maliki Madhab, the supererogatory prayers, that the Nawafil prayers, um, while you know, once you come to the masjid, you, you pray two rakahs of tahiyyatul masjid, you know, the, the two rakahs in the sal of salutation to the masjid. But if in the Maliki Mazhab, if you come between the time of Asr and Maghrib, because there's another hadith that pr prohibits praying nawafil or supererogatory prayers during that time, Malikis do not pray the tahiyyatul masjid if they would come to the masjid between the time of Asr and Maghrib. So he, Imam Malik came just before, a little before Maghrib and he sat down. He did not pray the Hayat al-Masjid. And so there was a younger person who was sitting there next to him. He said, get up and pray two rakats. And so Imam Malik immediately followed suit. He stood up and he pray, started praying. Now, when he was done with his prayer, you know, his students had, had looked at it and this whole incident and said so they came to him and they asked him, have you changed your opinion or have, uh, or have you gone back to what you had originally taught us? And he said, I've done neither. I simply fear that if I did not bow down Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would include me among, uh, amongst the people about whom he said that when they're asked to bow down in prayer, they do not bow down. So now he was not, Imam Malik was not obligated, yet he took it as a sign that essentially did not reflect his ego, but essentially it, it reflected his higher character and, and, and his desire and his longing to build that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we experience trials or tribulation, the fact that it's, whether it's a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or whether it's a test, so long as we're willing to invest our time in, in building and strengthening, strengthening that connection with the divine, it really becomes immaterial. Because really there, there is no absolute way of, of, of determining if it's either of the two. Okay. Um, one of the greatest of fitna that we've been told about is the fitna of Dajjal. Can you comment a little bit on how we should approach the fitna of Dajjal and how we should protect ourselves from it? Okay. Um, there isn't much that I can say myself. Um, so I, I, I kind of anticipated that question. So I, I just have a hadith that I would like to just read through, uh, which is a hadith that's related in Bukhari, and, and the companion uh, from whom it's related is Hudayfa ibn Yaman. So uh, it's, it's said that um, Hudayfa ibn Yaman uh, said that the people used to ask the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about good things, but I used to ask him about bad things, fearing I would live to see such things. I said, O Messenger of Allah, we were in a state of ignorance and evil. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us this good, referring to Islam. Will there be any evil after this good? He said, yes. So uh, I said, will there be any good after that evil? The Prophet said, yes, but it will be tainted. I said, how will it be tainted? He said, there will be some people who will guide others in a way that is not according to my guidance you will approve some of their deeds and disapprove of others. I said, will there be any evil after that good? He said, yes, there will be people calling at the gates of hell and whoever responds to their call, they will throw them into it, into the fire that is. I said, O Messenger of Allah, describe them to us. He said, they will be coming, they will be from among our people speaking our language. I said, what do you command me to do if I live to see such a thing? He said, adhere to the jama'ah. Adhere to the jama'ah of the Muslims and their imam. I asked, what if there is no jama'ah and no leader? He said, then keep away from all those groups 
even if you have to bite the roots of a tree until death overtakes you while you are in that state. Now, we may be approaching those times. And, and, and so when we look at the, the situation of us Muslims living in the West, we do have a sense of community. Uh, and, and so really getting closer to that community and, and contributing to whatever extent, I think that is something that we are all capable of doing. Uh, we haven't gotten to the point where any kind of isolation would be required. Uh, but so long as we continue to uh, to strengthen our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to strengthen, uh, strengthen our connection with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, that itself would be sufficient um, whether or not we live to experience the trial of Dajjal in our own life, it, it, it too becomes relatively immaterial from that standpoint, so long as our focus is to attain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so long as we're able to connect and, and maintain that connection with the our community and, and Jama'ah as well. Jazakallah Karen. Part of being able to deal with the tests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in front of us is to be able to recognize that we're being tested in the first place and to be quick in recognizing that this is a test from Allah. What advice do you give us in terms of you know, a checklist or, or some daily habit um, that we should adopt uh, to try to be more self-aware of when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us? I think it goes back to the same question that we talked about, that there is no certain way um, for a person for a person who's been involved, I mean, it's a difficult question to respond to if, if you want to come up with a more generic response. I think a lot of times, given that we ourselves individually are aware of what we, we do, irrespective of whatever image we project, or whatever we, we facade we, we uh, put in front of us, we ourselves are aware that if we've been involved in any kind of wrongdoing, um, and, and, and we are now taking up a path of taking up some kind of corrective measures in our, whether it's our character or our belief and what have you. Uh, and it, during that time, if we are tested at, in, in one way or the other, or if we experience any kind of trials, you may be able to map it with what, whatever actions you have been involved in. But, but as, I, as I said, there is no absolute way of determining whether whatever you're experiencing is a result of your own actions or it's a result of of a, a trial so um, that, that you're or tests that you're being subjected to and and, and so it, it's really difficult as, as I mentioned our focus really should be in in maintaining and, and ensuring that we have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we, we continue to build and, and strengthen that connection. I want to start memorizing the Quran. Do you have any tips to do it every day and become, uh, and for it to become an everyday habit? Um, so I've had, I ha I've had some friends who've memorized Quran uh, so, like, I had a Sudanese friend who memorized Quran uh, from Surah Baqarah, starting from Surah Baqarah and Surah Al-Nas, uh, to all the way to Surah Al-Nas. And then, uh, a couple of years later, when I asked him, he said he was memorizing it again. And so, I asked what happened. Uh, and so, it turned out that uh, a lot of my friends who had memorized, they did not really maintain a routine of revising, and so it became a challenge for them. Uh, if the intention, if you have an intention of memorizing Quran, uh, I, I think it's important to understand that, well, first of all, you're not obligated. Uh, secondly, there is an obligation that would come about as a result once you do memorize that the Quran. And, and so if you feel that you're willing to undertake that, uh, there are different ways that you could do it. So one of the tips, for example, is that any kind of memorization that you do, there is a a certain period of time within which if you continue to revise, 
that essentially helps in uh, in strengthening it because initially when you memorize it, it is, gets registered in your short-term memory and it takes a while to get registered in, into your long, long-term memory and that requires frequent repetition and some spacing and so forth. And there are different techniques that, that, that are available but one of the tips would be if you're memorizing Quran, you essentially want to memorize right before you, at least the part where you're learning a newer part, a newer verses, right before you go to sleep and then revise it earlier on in the morning. So somehow the process of sleeping, even when you haven't really memorized it thoroughly, once you go to sleep soon after that practice, when you get up in the morning, somehow our it's just the way our memory functions that it, it registers much more easily and it can you can easily get it on your tongue. And that's why a lot of people who, who would practice um, for the taraweeh, what they would do is they would, uh, instead of learning or, or revising just on the same day, they would essentially revise a night before. So it, it registers and then they can then recite that particular juice uh, in, in, uh, in the following night. So that, that would be one of the tips that uh, I would mention. Jazakallah khair, Brother Yasser. So with that, we will end the Q&A session. Uh, I'd like to thank Brother Yasser for his words of advice and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to implement what we have heard. Inshallah, next week's session will be given by Imam Khalid Griggs uh, and it will be, uh, we will be studying uh, Surah An-Nisa verses 131 to 137. Right, so with that, we'll end. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa and. Astaghfiruk wa atubu wa alik. Awudu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa ala asr. Inna al-insana lafi khus. Illa al-ladhina amun wa amil as-sanihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haq. Wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Sadaqallahu al-azim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.